just a minute, bear with me. Multitasking madly here. All right. <laughs> All right. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Lori Desatel. Is uh, she is an assistant professor at Butler University at the School of Education in Indiana, Indianapolis, and is also the founder of Educational Neuroscience Symposium. I met uh, Lori uh, during the Learning in the Brain conference and went to one of her sessions. I was very inspired by it, and, and uh, she graciously, uh, when I asked her to come to run the session, she she didn't hesitate to say yes. Mm -hmm. Lori, it's such a pleasure to have you. I'm going to hand you the floor and, and welcome. Uh, we're, we're all looking forward to your presentation. Oh, thank you, Robert, so much. And um, wow, thank you all. This is just such an honor um, to be um, virtually in Denver um, this afternoon and um, to be a part of just what I feel is leading edge research and the application of this research. And this is really challenging for me because I'm gonna try to um, kind of give you this infomercial in 45 minutes. Um, and hopefully um, when we leave each other um, in those 45 minutes, um, you will have some tangible practices that you can take with you, whether you are parenting or you're teaching or your administration or um, in any capacity where you work with youth and children. Um, and, you know, I feel very honored, Robert and I were talking, to be doing this presentation sitting beside you in this pandemic time. Um, I don't, you know, here I'm, I'm talking to you tonight about how adversity and trauma affect brain development and our stress response systems and, and how they can change our perceptual hormonal immune systems. I mean, everything in the body shifts when we are experiencing significant adversity and trauma, um, and here we are sitting in this. So um, I want to, again, thank you all for being here. I'm going to go really quickly, um, but I'm gonna hopefully leave you with some very um, helpful resources, and then also to connect with me through social media when we're finished. Um, but Robert, thank you for the introduction. I do wanna share with you, I teach at Butler, but one of the things that um, it's not one of, it's the most important part of my work. And that is I am back in the classroom. So I am teaching graduate and undergraduate students at Butler University. And we have an incredible applied educational neuroscience certification, brain and trauma. That's a nine hour certification. We are working to put it completely online. Um, so there'll be synchronous and asynchronous courses with me. Um, so that, um, feel free to email me if you would like to learn more about that. Um, six years ago, I returned to the K through 12 classroom. I was in Indianapolis. Um, I was at Marion University at the time, and I was observing first and second year special education teachers. Um, and I knew that I was not walking the walk. I had lost touch with the um, K through 12 um, environment. And um, I'm a former special education teacher, a former school counselor. Um, I worked at Methodist Hospital here in Indianapolis on the adolescent psychiatric unit, but I had not been in the classroom in a long time. So tonight or this afternoon, it's, it's evening here in Indianapolis, but this afternoon, all of these practices are strategies and practices that don't come out of a textbook. They're not out of a lab. Um, they are what we are implementing and, and integrating into our stra into procedures and routines and, and transitions, morning meetings. And I want to be very clear this evening. Everything I'm talking about is about parenting. I would have been a very different mom had I known what I know now. So it's not just about teaching. It really is a way of grandparenting. It's a way of parenting. It's a way of being a better partner. It's a way of going and being in life and really taking care of our brain and body state. This pandemic is throwing us into a time that none of us knew um, and we don't know. We've never experienced. This is a global trauma. It is a national trauma. And we do know that when our schools reopen, 
um, we, we do know they're going to look different. Um, we also know that our children and adolescents communicate behaviorally um, when the body is in distress. I want to share this with you really briefly because this I found this. Um, it's by Stephanie Grant, and she writes, in the fall, I will remind schools that some of our children will tell us in their behaviors. My body remembers the pandemic. My body remembers the grief and the loss, isolation, fear, hunger, and danger. I was alone. My body remembers when this school that I trusted suddenly disappeared. I don't know if I can trust you. What if it happens again? I need to keep myself safe. So here's what happened. Six years ago, I was given a course release and I returned to the classroom. So this work that I'm sharing tonight is the work I've been doing across Washington Township in Indianapolis and through two Indianapolis public schools that are Butler University Lab Schools. This coming fall, I'm going to be, um, I actually don't know where I'm going to be. I am looking for a district that wants me, that is close to home, um, where I can go in um, and really um, be a, in an environment where I can co-teach like I've been doing and to model for staff and to create almost a pilot school for this work. Um, it's been incredible. Butler has um, provided that course release, but I've done my work now um, in the lab schools and I'm ready to move on um, into um, a district that um, is a little bit higher needs than the schools that I have been in. But let me tell you, we have seen a lot of trauma and adversity um, in our um, IPS schools. I mean, we're struggling. And across the nation, our new learning disability is anxiety. We are seeing more and more of our children and adolescents coming in rough and coming in super dysregulated. So this pandemic is a layering of, um, you know, the trauma and the adversities that so many of our children are already experiencing. I'm gonna start off tonight with this quote because this is a strategy and a practice and within the framework of applied educational neuroscience, this is a touch point. I'm afraid, said Rabbit. What are you afraid of, asked Bear. I don't know, replied Rabbit, I just am. Then I will sit with you until you're not afraid anymore, said Bear. We will face it together. And what I wanna to share tonight is that attachment and connection build brain architecture. Secure attachments develop our nervous systems. And the greatest time of development is in the first 1,000 days of life. That is utero through year two. Now, development is hot and messy and chaotic. But what we know is that our brains require connection from other human beings to develop securely and to develop physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being. This year, I've been in fifth grade. I've been working, and just like many of you, when I left them in early March, I had no idea that I was not going to be with that fifth grade class again. I'm going to end tonight with a strategy that we were actually working on when I left and I heard from my co-teacher, Emily Wilkerson, um, and she shared with me, sent me a text last night and said, Lori, I wanna tell you that the, chill, the, the, the fifth graders are still doing this at home and they're working on this at home and it's called my wise self. And so I'm gonna share that with you this evening. So we're just gonna go through um, just a little bit. I'm gonna be um, going through these slides. There are 84 and, um, believe me, we're only going to get through maybe about 10. Um, and so I bear with me as I kind of scroll back and forth. But stress is good for us. So I'm not here tonight to say that, um, you know, stress is a bad thing. There is um, what we're talking about through this pandemic and with some of the adversity, adverse childhood experiences that we're seeing in our classrooms across the country and across the world. This is toxic levels of stress. And those toxic levels are unpredictable, they're extreme, they're prolonged, and they sensitize the set points in our brain, meaning we have a new normal. So many of the kids and many of us, when we are 
going through hard, tough times, our, our homeostasis actually elevates. So we are in a new normal, which is a hypervigilant, hyperarousal response. We have a new sensitization and a vulnerability. So we get triggered really easily. And all of us know that. We've all gone through weeks or months or years where we've gone through significant adversity in our own lives. And we know how dysregulated we feel. So trauma happens in the body. It is a physiological nervous system response. It is not just about the brain. And we know that when trauma occurs, the information comes in in large amounts. It's fast and it's constant. So tolerable stress we need we need that because it's predictable it's moderate it feels controllable and it builds resiliency so i want to begin tonight i want you to leave with something you can have in 40 minutes 30 minutes and this is a sensation word wall um, i'm going to be sharing that the brain is complex it is organized and integrated in ways we don't even understand yet in science. So I'm gonna be very, tonight I'm gonna to be very inaccurate for many of you because I'm gonna be talking about it in simplistic ways. But what we do know is that the brain is built from the very back to the front. So from the brain stem, and if you put your hands on your forehead right now, just right there, right above your eyebrows, this is the prefrontal cortex. And this comes on board not until late 20s, early 30s. And so what we know is that the language of the brainstem is sensation. Many of our children and many of us don't even have a good feeling vocabulary. I want you to think about the last six weeks and how this pandemic has hit you. And I mean hit you. Now, some of us may be experiencing um, some relaxation with this, or we might be feeling a sense of calm, or maybe we've developed a routine, but for many of us, we, I don't know about all of you, but I don't even know what day it is when I get up, wake up in the morning. I open my eyes and I have to hesitate because I feel like we need to create a new day of the week, like no day or, or all day. Um, but my heart can start to beat quickly. Or maybe at times I will feel like something is caught in my chest. You know, I can't get a deep breath. Or sometimes I get this kind of, um, sweaty feeling, like when is this going to be over? Um, I feel like I'm kind of suffocating in this kind of surreal bubble. These sensations, when we can name them, they are calming to the nervous system. And the body holds, and this is amazing, 11 million bits, 11 million bits of sensory information come into us every second of every day. And that right now is information overload. So when we talk about sensory information, it's ongoing, it doesn't stop, and it's held in the body and held in implicit memory. So we're not left-brained or right-brained, but this trauma and adversity is held in right hemisphere. Um, this is where trauma, negative emotion, where our sense of mind, body, self starts to form in early development. So when you think about um, all of this coming in, I want to give you about 10, 15 seconds, and I want you to think of a, sensa a sensation that you've experienced over the last couple of days or week, and I want you to give it a color, give it a shape, give it a size, you know, how big is it? Just picture it in your mind or draw it as I'm talking to you this evening. This is the language of the brainstem. This is where all internal and external stimuli come in. And they actually, when they come in, they, they, they signal, am I safe? Can I trust this environment? You know, what's happening around me? This, and so if we've experienced a lot of adversity, our sense of safety and trust has been compromised and distorted. So oftentimes uh, we can be teaching and everything's going beautifully in a class. And all of a sudden we have somebody who just throws, you know, who jumps out of their seat, screams, yells, you know, runs, how many of you have runners? They run out of the room. And then 
you're thinking, what the hell just happened? And so what we know is we can get triggered by smells, by sounds, by um, somebody's posture, by the way someone smells, by a piece of clothing or the tone of someone's voice. So tonight, I, I, again, when you can draw your sensation, this is a routine I would have used as a mom. We would have had a sensation word jar. I would have had a sensation wall. And, and we would have drawn these and colored them. And this is a great routine um, to do before class begins, before you go to bed at night, maybe when you get up in the morning, because every single one of these strategies I'm sharing tonight are practices and strategies that are good for all of us not just those kids or these kids. These are part of our routines and part of our procedures. So when we think about trauma and adversity, it happens on a continuum. It's body overwhelm. It's too much, too fast, too soon. And it's held in body sensory implicit memory. And so why I get so super excited about this, and Robert knows this when I was sharing in California, I love to help the districts to understand that we're preparing the brain and we're getting the brain ready to learn. Because, and I'm gonna skip some slides, so close your eyes if this makes you dizzy, because we just don't have time tonight to go through all of these and I will come back. But this is what I wanna share with you right here. Looking at this, your prefrontal cortex is the seat of language. And when you think of of when it doesn't develop until 28, 29, 30 years old, our children, even my college students, have an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex. And so if you can see the amygdala, the amygdala is sitting, if you make two oval shapes with your hands, I'm doing this right now, and put them above your ears, then right in each temporal lobe of the brain is the brain smoke detector. And it is the brain's um, threat detection center. And so when a stimulus comes in, it signals the limbic structures of the brain to start activating and fire. And, and we then are in a fight, flight, or shut down state. And this prefrontal cortex, the, you know, right behind our eyeballs, can, it goes offline. So what we know is when we build these practices and strategies of calming and regulation into the brain and for our children before the school day begins or when during a routine even at home, then we have a brain that is ready to learn, it's ready to problem solve. So applied educational neuroscience is a framework and it is not a program. Maybe many of your schools are using conscious discipline or zones of regulation or leader and me or second step or PBIS, you know, this is not that. It is a framework that supports everything in school and it has four legs. It has attachment and feel free to take pictures of any of these slides. You're welcome to do that tonight. Um, it has, so we talk about touch points, that's strengthening connections with children. My brain state matters more than anything. My regulated calm brain state so regulation is the second leg. Um, the third leg is we teach our children about their neuroanatomy. So we've got um, my brain state, attachment, regulation, and we give the science to our students and to ourselves. Because oftentimes we can talk about mindful moments or calm corners, but kids just, they don't, you know, it doesn't matter to them. So we're really taking this framework and we're talking about the amygdala first aid station or an amygdala um, reset station. I love this quote from the good earth because it says, for they were not evil men except when they were starved. And I think that's so true of all of us. When any of us are in a fight, flight or shut down, we are not pleasant. We are, we can lash out, we get triggered, we can look violent or aggressive or disruptive. And all behaviors are communicating and all behaviors are signals. And so we are really excited to introduce this new perception of discipline through a brain aligned lens, which I will talk to at the end tonight. But we know that this COVID-19 has added a layer of adverse childhood experiences 
on to what so many of our families are already experiencing. This study that was conducted in the 90s was the largest public health study of its kind. It's changed everything for me as um, a teacher. And we know that our children who walk into our classrooms and schools with four or more adverse childhood experiences, and that's not many, are almost 40 times now more likely to have academic and behavioral challenges. So COVID-19 has added to these adversities for many of our families in Indiana right now. 1.1 million of our students when this pandemic started, that's two thirds of our student population did not have access to the internet or e-learning. And that is a significant adversity. That's why we know these big achievement gaps are adversity gaps. So the COVID-19 has produced chronic unpredictability. The brain cannot take that. It's hard on brain tissue when there is chronic adversity and unpredictable adversity. The second condition the brain cannot take is isolation. And that's something that is happening right now with the pandemic and then emotional and physical restraint. And our brains are, these are conditions that can, when they are chronic, are hard on brains. So what we are looking at is a brain that is really not a disorder. You know, I, I taught children with the classification of emotionally disturbed. These kids weren't emotionally disturbed. These kids were coming in with a brain that had reordered connections based on experiences. I wanna share this with you this evening. The brain is built by one main ingredient, and I'm not talking about avocados or water or sleep or exercise. All of those are important. But what builds brains is experience. Our brains are experience dependent. They are historical, social, experience dependent organs that act like muscles. So whatever experiences we give our children or adolescents or whatever experiences a child comes into the world in is how that brain begins to develop. So um, we know that children are very open and can feel the pain and suffering in their environments. This is Dr. Dr. Gabor Mate's research. And he states, if the mother is suffering, the baby is suffering too, because emotions are contagious. Human beings are contagious. So the question I want us to think about tonight is, yes, we can ask what happened to this child, but I wanna ask another question this evening. What kinds of worlds do our students get? And, and when we ask that question, we begin to get beneath the behaviors and understand that those disrespectful, oppositional, defiant, withdrawn, shutdown behaviors are pain-based behaviors. And these are based on experiences. So the adverse childhood experience study is really the theory of everything. And that's not being dramatic. It is the correlation between childhood adversity, the building of brain architecture, and adult well-being. So I, and I know I'm going really quickly. Um, I wish I had three days with all of you. We would have so much fun, I promise. We would never get tired of each other. So this is new. This is what um, my new book is going to be about. It's rewiring our perceptions of discipline based on the science, connections over compliance. I want you to think of an RTI triangle. And what we know is that when we build engagement, when we strengthen relationships in the classroom and touch points, that's a tier one practice. These practices are evidence-based, many are research-based, and these are discipline preventative brain aligned relational practices on the front end. And this is the shift we have to make if we are truly going to be a trauma responsive school. I'm gonna say this to you this evening. There are many trauma programs out there, and I am so grateful for all of them. But a school that has implemented a trauma program does not automatically become trauma responsive. A trauma responsive school has changed their discipline protocols. And it's really that simple. So I am 
so excited to share these practices and strategies that build engagement that are intentionally touch points and that begin in tier one and they are good for all students. Educational neuroscience is a framework and it supports everything else. So you can see we all have a brain and this is why we use that framework. When we return in the fall, we are going to see many of our students struggling with some manipulation and control. And because, because emotions are contagious, this is gonna to look tough for many of us. Because when our children and youth from, come from challenging adversities and trauma, that is a part of who and how they've survived. If they don't manipulate, they feel they won't survive. If they don't control the situation, they feel that they're not gonna make it. So these are protective coping strategies. And this is prob these are probably, when I go into schools and districts, these are probably the most dysregulating behaviors for adults to see. What can we do about this? Um, I'm gonna speak to you, and I keep looking at the time. I'm gonna speak to you um, about a few strategies but I, I'm gonna share about tonight, frequent feedback and check-ins are touch points, giving a child regulatory routines of things that feel good to them, like some space, some time, holding something soft, something weighted, um, sucking on a mint, getting a sip of water, walking, taking your pulse is even calming, just getting your own heart rate can slow it down. Um, in the schools that I'm working in and in the districts. Um, I'm doing a lot of work in Iowa right now. Um, I'm doing a lot of work, um, obviously, in our 90 counties in Indiana. And um, I just threw a blank, where else am I? I, I can't remember, but I, um, we're calling these, people get kind of freaked out when you say meditation um, in, in schools. And meditation is an executive function practice. It exercises these executive functions. So we're calling these focused attention practices. And I'll be glad, um, Robert, if we have emails, I can send some resources tonight for those folks attention practices that focus on breathing, focus on a sound, a taste, um, a visualization. I wanna speak to you about nonverbal communication because it's huge. And nonverbal communication is 97% of our communication and we read it. Kids in stress are reading your eyes from like they're you're reading they're reading your face from the eyes up. They are watching how you gesture. They're looking at your posture and they're listening to your tone. So these that nonverbal assurance is very calming to a child. In words, nobody in the history of being told to calm down has ever calmed down. And so that's why it's very important that we meet children in the brain state where they are and words sometimes are not, not the answer. Resiliency and empathy and kindness are skills like math, reading, and science. And I wanna be very clear about this this evening. We have the potential to read. It's a new circuit in a brain, 5,000 years old, but we have to be taught how to read. We have to have the experiences of being read to and learning um, the reading skills. Resiliency and kindness and empathy are no different. If a child is never exposed to kindness, they don't develop the circuits in the brain for kindness. If a child is not exposed to resilient situations and people, they don't develop that. And in, in what we know is that patterned, repetitive, um, soma to sensory, sensory experiences, pattern repetitive experiences can build circuits in the brain that become hardwired, but it does not happen by wishing it would happen. And I'm, I'm going to say this to you tonight. We are a society that just gets very compliant with getting obedience and compliance from our kids. And we're not getting a sustainable behavioral change Behaviors need to be taught. Behaviors are like resiliency. Many of our children come in and their behaviors look aggressive or violent or disrespectful. But if you're not exposed to the behaviors that you need to adapt to a world that's social, then you don't develop those. 
our greatest superpowers, our neuroplasticity and the miraculous ability our brain has to be social. We are feeling and sensing creatures who think. We are not thinking creatures who feel. It is our brain's superpower when exposed to an experience or an event that we actually can change. Your brain will be very different after you leave me tonight than it was before you came into this Zoom meeting. Every experience changes the brain structurally and functionally, the way we greet a child, the tone in our voices, the way an entrance to a room looks. We are, our other superpower is emotional regulation. Secure attachments build emotional regulation. Secure attachments drive not only nervous system development and all the systems in our bodies that begin to develop, but it, it literally provides the precipice for emotional regulation. So as I share with you some strategies in these last few minutes, this is really, again, I apologize for the scientists out there. Um, I know I've simplified this this evening, but through an educational lens, we know this, and I want you to hear this this evening. The, the language of the brain stem is sensation. And if a child doesn't feel safe in an environment, and that's a perception, they don't learn. If a teacher doesn't feel safe in a teaching environment, they don't teach well. If an administrator is not feeling safe in an environment, they don't teach well or lead well. We need to feel safe and then we move up into the limbic structures and the question is, am I felt? Am I loved? So if a child doesn't feel safe and they don't feel felt, they don't learn. And the brain develops from back to front and from the inside out. And so these practices and strategies, regulatory and connection, are meeting students in regulation and connection so that they can have integrated, organized lower brain regions so we can access those executive functions that are in the prefrontal cortex. This is Dr. Bruce Perry's slide, and I love this slide because it shows that in the first column, when you're calm at the bottom, your mental state is calm, you can, you, you can have abstract thinking, you're functioning from the cortex, and your time is, you think about the next year, you think about next month, but then you get worried, then you get a little agitated, and you kind of move in to that survival state, but you're, but you're not quite there. So your thinking becomes more concrete. And now you're worried about what's going to happen this afternoon or what might, might happen this evening. So your sense of time changes. Then you move into the limbic structures, the alarm center, where the amygdala is firing. And then you start to think about hours and minutes. And then we move into fear and terror, where we downshift into the brainstem, where we shut down, we dissociate, we numb. And, and this is where literally that brain stem, the reptilian brain, does not have a sense of time because old traumas can bubble up to the surface and they can, we make associations subconsciously, implicitly, and we can get triggered and, and, and we feel time is almost stopped for us. So this is really, and again, I'm so sorry I'm going so quickly, but this is really something to think about. So I'm going to skip through some of these right now. Um, again, my apologies. I do want to show you that the brain, look at the development in the first 1,000 days of life. This is, this is not about neurons. This is about synapses. So this brain is developing at such a rapid pace in those first 1,000 days. And you might think to yourself, well, Lori, why are you telling me that tonight? I teach 10-year-olds or I'm a high school AP biology teacher because the behaviors and those perceptual maps, those mind maps of our students who are 18 or 15, those maps can resemble those experiences that happened early in life. So we teach our students that that amygdala is like a chihuahua. It is like, it, it's, it's our alarm system as Dr. Joseph Ledoux shares, it is our threat detection center. We know that the amygdala works in the limbic system with the hippocampus. This is our short-term memory area where we have spatial and visual and emotional memory and we encode memories here. But when you are 
in a survival, getting ready to fight, getting ready to run or shut down, there we can see cell dam. I'm sorry, tissue damage in the hippocampus, but we can also see neurogenesis in the hippocampus. Think about it. If a child doesn't have strong memory capacity, they don't learn very well. So let's go to, I'm gonna leave you with some strategies this evening. And um, this is, boy, is this true. Kids in stress create in adults their feelings. And if not trained, the adults will mirror that behavior. So here we go. We are using this polyvagal chart as a check-in for students. I would have used this at home with my own children. This is a great way to check in with kids and to, and, and to check in with adults. If I'm a principal of a building, if I'm a dean of a university and I'm holding um, a staff or faculty meeting, I would love to have everybody have this on a Google Doc, um, on a Google Drive, or have this, you could have this as a laminated wall size poster um, where our staff and our students can check in because our brain states change daily. They change minute by minute, hour by hour. And so that purple line is where most of us function, but many of us come in in that orangey red area and that becomes our new normal. So we know that Dan Siegel's work shares that what you can share, you can bear, and what you can name, you can tame. So these check-ins, and I can send you the templates for younger children. We have another one for younger children that we're using also. It's really important for us, I wish we all had a poster size of this, that we could be, that we can be a thermostat and not a thermometer. I think it's, co our emotions are so contagious that we can pick up and get inside of a conflict or a power struggle before we even want to or you have even noticed it. So please understand that it takes a regulated adult to regulate a child. A dysregulated adult cannot regulate a child. That is why my brain and body state are the most important. And co-regulation is part of this new lens for discipline. I am not rewarding negative behavior when I co-regulate. I am making sure that both myself and my student, or my, as a parent, my child, we don't talk or discuss or make a plan or talk about consequences until we are calm and regulated. And this really shows, this is a slide that really shows this, and this is from Dr. Bruce Perry. This is called relational contagion. A regulated, calm adult can regulate a dysregulated, anxious child, but a dysregulated adult can never regulate a dysregulated child. So this is really important for us to look at, and the brain is built, again, from the bottom to the top, and you can see this is a clear depiction of that. So here's what I'm going to share with you this evening, and I am so excited to share this with everybody. Um, this is brand new. It's, a, it's an ebook of brain-aligned strategies that can become a part of your procedures or your um, transitions. They can be a part of morning meeting, your routines, and they meet students in brain development. So you can see that the, the ones coded in blue are for brain stem. They're focused attention practices. They're focusing on rhythm and touch and pressure. They are meeting children in sensory needs, repairing, repairing senses that have become um, agitated and activated and giving children a sense of calm. So um, then we move into, and I will go to this, the connection strategies. This is the language of the limbic system. And this is feelings. So these are touch points. We call these touch points in applied educational neuroscience. And these um, can be ways that we engage with our tone, a calm tone, the way we look at a child. Um, I've created lots of activities here that build and strengthen connection between adults and students. Um, and, and so many ideas, but I'm not gonna go through those. I think they're pretty self-explanatory. These are cortical strategies. So once a child is calm and they're feeling a sense of relaxed alertness, then we can use words because the, the, the language of the cortex is words. So I, I'm gonna end tonight with a strategy that I have shared and you all can have this, um, but I, I want you to know that um, 
this is, these are for you. And I don't want you to get overwhelmed and think, oh my gosh, I can't do all this. This is, think of educational neuroscience as the plate. And we put everything else on the plate. This holds everything that you do. And so I'm gonna go to this strategy and let me find this here. Um, these are amygdala reset stations and, and I've got a YouTube channel, I've got my website I'll share with you. Um, and I can send you all kinds of information on amygdala reset areas that you could do at home and at school. We have families in Indiana that sent me these pictures. They've set up amygdala areas at home right now during COVID. So these are children. They've created this safe space where children can go and they can just feel a sense of calm, where they can co-regulate with the adults. Um, and we're setting these up in the classroom. We're calling these amygdala reset or amygdala um, uh, first aid stations. Um, so let me. Um, right, I'm gonna. Vote. I'm gonna stop you there. Um, okay. The chat's going quite <laughs> rapidly, but there's okay. one question I do want to make sure I get because it's the yeah. issue of asynchronous teaching. Because we have a lot of teachers who are not, you know, they they're they have a lot of time not connected with their students. So in right. terms of helping them support their regulation, do you have strategies to that end? Yes, so when you're not connecting with them and you're doing it through packets, touch points, doing like giving them a drawing and you start the drawing and they finish the drawing or journaling back and forth, creating a story together, creating, um, you know, just giving them something that they can draw, something that they can write or giving them a validation, a post-it note, you know, telling them here's something you could do that's so cool um, that we've talked about is you all know your students and you left them so abruptly. What is one special thing about a trait about that student that you know, like maybe they had a death in the family right before this all happened. Maybe they love horses. Maybe they love sports. So connect with them personally through, you know, um, you know, a handwritten note, um, you know, asking them personal questions, um, not too personal, but, you know, giving them a sense of, wow, this teacher sees me and feels me. But I think dual drawings, dual story writing, you know, sharing notes and journaling back and forth is, is a great way to stay connected in this time. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Um, you could even share this with them through a learning packet. Um, you could even track your, you could show your brain state for the past week and you could show where you track. This is for elementary students. Um, and so this is something you could do, you know, at home with your own kids or when you return or send it in an e-learning packet and share with them that, you know, how were, how did you move through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday this week? So um, this is another way we, you know, we check in with them. Um, these are focused attention practices and brain intervals. And so this is a great thing to do. Challenge your students. Um, with, um, you could even write out a focused attention practice or a brain interval and maybe even challenge each other and then reflect through writing or reflect through um, whatever means you have. How did that feel to you? Um, to take three deep breaths or to do 30 seconds tracing your hand, um, you know, and, and sharing what the, how you experienced each of these. So I'm going to send these, I mean, you're, actually these are on my website, so you'll be able to have those. Um, so I want to be very respectful of your time. You can see I've got so many other things to share, but this is what I want to end with. If you could do this with your students, it's called My Wise Self, and you can send this in a reading packet or a homework packet. It doesn't, you don't have to be on the computer. You don't have to be synchronous. Um, so one of the things we did with fifth grade, we asked them, if you had a wise self, and it could be some imaginary person, it could be an animal, you can do a make-believe character. What does that person, what, who is that person? Um, what do they look like? Could you draw them? Is this an animal? Is it, um, you know, did you make it up? I mean, what does this person look like? What do they smell like? Um, and if they are always giving you good advice and they are calming and soothing to you, what do you imagine your wife's, your wise self saying to you? How do they bring you joy? What words of comfort do they share? What do they do to help you to feel better? 
Our students love this right now. They're making posters of their wise self and they're actually hanging them up in their rooms. And they, um, this was the email that I, or the text message I got from Emily last night, how they are continuing to even create more versions of their wise self and, and have family for their wise self and a home for their wise self. And then they'll be able to share it, um, you know, with families and with you. Um, you know, if, even if it's not daily or through um, syn or, uh, asynchronous, or I'm sorry, synchronous teaching. So I wanted to leave that with you tonight. So um, I know this has been really fast and I apologize. Please connect with me um, through Twitter. Um, it's Desitel underscore PhD. There's my Butler email. Um, feel free to email me. The website has a COVID-19 resource section for parents and teachers with videos that I'm recording. Um, follow me on Facebook, um, LinkedIn, Instagram. And um, I just can't thank you enough. Um, I believe uh, Robert and Tim, I didn't mention Tim, but I can't thank you enough for having me. This is the research from tonight um, and the resources. This is our newest book, Eyes Are Never Quiet. It came out in 2018. Um, it is, it really addresses and has a, about, I don't know, 60 pages of a toolkit in the back um, with all, it's a 100 day educational neuroscience toolkit. You can also find that on the Indiana Department of Education's website as Dr. Brandy Oliver and I co-wrote the social and emotional competencies for the state of Indiana. So, um, and the new book will be out. I'll be doing a lot of promoting of that on social media and some kind of pre uh, podcast for the book. But I just, I thank all of you for what you're doing. Your roles changed overnight. You're, te you're teaching, you're parenting, you're cleaning, you're administrating, you're just doing it all. And I'm just, um, I'm really, really um, in awe of, of all of you. So um, again, please stay connected. Robert and Tim, thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to hear back and, and love to stay in touch with everybody. Any questions? I'm happy to stay for questions. If anyone has any thoughts or questions, I just, I wanted to be respectful of your time. That's great, Lori. Um, yeah, so I'll close up, uh, close up the session. Ooh, I need a breath. <sighs> <laughs> um, oh, I'm have, so sorry. I feel like I just everybody. So you're good. Oh. You're good, Lori. I, yeah. well, the nice thing is that I do have a lot of your resources that you gave me from the Learning of the Brain conference. Yeah. So I will compile those. I'll track some of the questions if people aren't able to stay. Um, but I would like to just take a moment to first off thank you again, Lori. Thank you. If you have if you bear with me just for a few seconds here. I do want to point out that we have resources at the, uh, um, and I will post uh, the recording of this session on our, 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 our website section that's helping to support educators and parents, dmns.org slash learn dmns at home. We do have a webinar that's following uh, on the 16th. Tim is actually going to do a session that actually dovetails very nicely with this session, the science of stress, practical strategies to help our students, Saturday, May 16th at nine o'clock. Um, this is still in support of teachers, um, is, is still gonna be offered for free. And then of course, um, every Tuesday, we are still here. See you next Tuesday for our regular programming of, of, of uh, tea time. All right. Robert, can I ask you a question? Can I get back on the screen and take everyone's picture before I get off? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, I forgot to do that. Camera's and back on. I'm gonna, can the cameras go back on really fast? Yeah, I put your cameras me. back on. Let me put, uh, let me stop sharing. Uh, let me stop sharing there. Okay. Oh, yay. Okay, That's everybody wave. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank have a, you, have Mari. A I'm going to stop the recording. If people have questions, please just hang out here and uh, you can unmute yourself.